Welcome everyone. Um, I'm really glad that you're joining the um, SEMA seminar today. I'm really happy that we have a wide range of participants from all over the world, really. For some of you, it must be the middle of the night or very early. Um, but I think it's also a really great opportunity to listen to um, a very prom promising young researcher, uh, Tina Nielsen, report on her expertise and her um, experience with uh, scaling in the climate system. My name is Kira Riefeld, and as a CBAS um, steering group member, I'm um, organizing this seminar series um, yeah, on climate variability from the smallest to the largest scales. So I'd like you, dear, par dear uh, participants, to also welcome Tina Nielsen. Um, she has a PhD in applied mathematics uh, from the University of Kumse. How well did I do on a scale from zero to 10? Very well, it's a 10, <laughs> sure. You're, you're very kind. Um, from 2018, she uh, currently is a postdoctoral fellow from uh, the Research Council. Um, and technically she would be in Germany at the moment um, since it is a Norwegian mobility grant, um, but due to the current COVID situation, she's back in Norway, where I'm sure um, you're also having a great time, but we would love to have you in Germany. Tina's expertise is predominantly, or very strongly, um, in um, yeah, applying mathematical and statistical methods uh, to climate reconstruction, to understanding of the climate system, and in particular scaling. She focuses in her recent work um, very strongly also on climate field reconstructions, how well they can actually do, um, and applying them to the Arctic and the North Atlantic. And I'm sure she'll give a great overview talk for us now. Tina, I'm looking forward to your talk. You Thank you very much, Kira. Um, thanks for organizing the seminar series and letting me have the opportunity to talk. And thanks also to everyone who is attending. So before we start, I just wanted to show you my background. I don't know how well you can see it. It's, it's a map uh, showing the different campuses of the University of Tromsø that are not only in Tromsø, but uh, it's this bigger yellow dot in the background. And I will come back to um, this in my talk. So I just wanted you to see if you can um, uh, catch it on the map and if you, so that you have an idea on where on earth is this. So I will introduce quite a number of concepts related to climate science. And I will first say a few words about um, climate variability and the dec decadal timescales in general. Then I will discuss two important modes of variability. Uh, these are the Atlantic decadal variability and the Pacific decadal variability. Then I will also introduce you to some simple climate modeling um, ideas and the scaling paradigm. And then we will have some conclusions at the very end. Yes, there we go. Okay, so uh, to start us off, this is a, a figure, a redrawing of a, a quite iconic figure from Mitchell in 1976. It is redrawn by Kira Reffeld, who's very kind to share it with me, thank you. And uh, so what we're looking at is basically the energy of the climate system as a function of frequency, or in this case, it has been uh, converted to period. So um, if we start from the highest frequency, we can see that the uh, diurnal cycle is very strong, has a very sharp peak in the spectrum. And uh, the annual cycle is also very strong. And then next, we jump all the way to the glacial cycles. So I will stay in my talk sort of in this uh, area right here. And uh, it seems quite steady. From the, um, from the power spectrum. So I didn't say this, both of the axes are logarithmic. So we get a general idea that the, uh, there is a background and with some 
uh, peaks and broader curves representing uh, specific elements of the climate system. So there have been many versions of this power spectrum since the 70s. And in particular, many studies show that the climate variability can be approximated by a linear fit in such a, a double logarithmic plot. So I will come back to this. But first, let us talk a little bit about climate in general. So the World Meteorological Organization, it defines climate as the average weather over a period of 30 years. But we can also think of climate as uh, the uh, statistical description uh, over a typical climate variability, surface, such as surface temperature, or precipitation, or wind. OK, so in this figure, I have just some illustrating uh, plots. Uh, first, you can see the daily temperature over one year in Tromsø. And uh, basically, you see here the uh, seasonal cycle. So uh, temperature peak in July and the minimum temperature in the winter in some place between January and March. So if you look over a 10 year period, actually most of what you can see is uh, this annual cycle. So it dominates uh, the uh, time series completely. So we can also look, for instance, at the annual mean temperature. It's uh, just three degrees plus. Tromsø is north of the Arctic Circle, a subpolar climate, but all things considered quite mild because it's um, influenced by the Gulf Current. So of course, the local climate is very different from the global climate. Here I plotted the uh, instrumental global temperature since 1850. And now we're looking at temperature anomalies. So we have subtracted a mean value. So this time series is um, dominated by a trend, which is due to uh, anthropogenic warming. And we'll come back to this. The black is then the average instrumental uh, observation. And this green cloud around represents uncertainties in the instrumental observations, especially for the earlier parts of the record. So here's another example record. This is for Durham in the UK. Uh, if you look at uh, a period of more than 100 years, it's again completely uh, dominated by the annual cycle. And if we zoom into the first 20 years, it's again very difficult to say anything about anything else but the annual cycle. So we can actually filter this away by calculating the climatology. So this is usually done for then a climatological period of 30 years, calculating the mean for every uh, month of the year. And then when we subtract this climatology, our deseasonalized record uh, is finally um, a little bit nicer or easier to interpret in terms of other uh, kinds of climate changes or variability. All right, so um, then I also wanted quickly just to make sure we are all on the same page to just to mention that climate variability um, is comprised of forced and internal dynamics. And natural climate variability excludes the human induced uh, changes. So if you again look at the instrumental observations for the global mean surface temperature, the easiest possible way to calculate this trend is using a linear fit. So if we remove this linear fit, then the residual can, in a simplistic matter, be. Um, uh, presented as the natural climate variability. You still see it has a lot of variability left. And if we plot uh, the power spectrum in a double logarithmic plot, it is very well approximated by a linear fit. This is what we can see here by these black uh, dots. 
And natural climate variability is different from internal variability, which is the part of climate that arises without the influence of forcing. All right, so I will use these terms a little bit later. I also wanted to say a few words about climate forcing. Uh, this is something that becomes more important as we move from the weather scales to the climate scales. I plotted here the time series um, <clears throat> for different forcing agents uh, after a um, data set by Hans Netta, 2011. So each of the components are plotted in color. And I think on top is the total forcing. It looks a little bit dominant here, um, but this is uh, the superposition of the individual forcing components and their unit is in watts per square, square meter. So the uh, human induced uh, forcing is uh, an increasing forcing influence, while the uh, volcanic forcing is seen as um, abrupt peaks during volcanic eruptions. And the blue curve, the solar forcing is a little bit in the background in this figure. It is um, um, varying, but very stable compared to the other forcing components. And then I plotted again, the global temperature, so that we can see that indeed the global temperature um, follows the forcing record, except it doesn't have extremely large volcanic uh, responses, for instance. So the global temperature response to a volcanic eruption is usually seen in the first year after the eruption or two years. And then there's uh, like an integrating factor into the deep ocean um, that I will maybe touch upon a little bit later. Okay, so I guess many of you have seen such a figure before. Uh, the climate system is complex and it consists of a lot of uh, subsystems that are interacting. And uh, we have uh, in influence from external forcing. So the main idea with this figure is to um, communicate that whenever we want to describe this uh, uh, system, we need uh, simplifications. And there are a number of different uh, possible simplifications for the system, and we will uh, look at a few of them. So it's impossible to cover all possible uh, climate models in one talk. But I guess also the later talks will um, uh, talk about this. Okay, so then we move to climate modes, which are one type of uh, descriptions for variations in the climate system. So these are some recurrent uh, patterns. Um, typically with a spatial um, uh, limitation and also a typical uh, temporal um, fingerprint that we can help us explain climate variability. So I listed a lot of different modes to the right and uh, not all of them are sort of occurring on the decadal scales and I don't have time for all. So you can look at these resources that I've also listed here if you want more information. So here we're going to focus on the uh, Atlantic decadal oscillation or variability, if you like, and the Pacific decadal oscillation. And as we um, uh, talk about this, we will also touch upon the North Atlantic oscillation and the El Nino Southern oscillation. Okay, so first about the AMV. Uh, as shown here, the index time series and the uh, uh, pattern or the region of the, of the climate mode. So uh, the AMV does not have a perfect periodicity, but it's periodic around 70 years. So you can see that there are positive phases of the mode and negative phases. Uh, at the bottom, you can see the region, which is used to uh, calculate the index, it's 
defined from 80 degrees west to zero degrees west and zero degrees north until 60 degrees north, approximately. There are also some differences between AMO data sets. And this uh, pattern is um, regression of the observed SSTs to the index. Okay, so the AMO is defined as the area, area average SST over the North Atlantic Ocean. And then the record is low pass filtered by a 10 year running mean and detrended by subtracting the global mean SST. So as you can see, it is um, usually uh, calculated from instrumental data set, so it only goes back to 1870. And that's quite a short record uh, for a mode with a 70 year periodicity. So we don't really have a lot of cycles. Um, yes, so this is sort of related to the reconstructions and um, I will come back to this very soon. A recent review paper uh, points to the AMOC as an uh, important driver for the, for the AMB. AMOC is the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation. And a number of studies have also uh, specifically using model experiments tested how external forcing is um, uh, influencing the AMB. So volcanic eruptions, greenhouse gas warming and aerosol um, cooling are all influencing factors. So this is not a completely internal mode of variability, it's also influenced by external forcing. All right, so what is the AMOC then? It is um, a transportation system. Um, so now we're looking at the North Atlantic branch. So uh, warm and salty water is transported from the tropics and northwards. Um, as it travels northwards, the surface water will lose heat to the atmosphere. There's a strong temperature gradient and eventually the water becomes so uh, dense and cold that it sinks. Uh, cold, uh, more um, fresh water is then um, returned as bottom currents. And this is uh, the transportation system of the AMOC. So in particular, the overturning is happening in the Labrador Sea, right here, and in the Nordic Seas. Well, at least in um, a simplified manner, you can say this. So then the next question is, uh, how is this useful? What is actually driving changes in the AMOC? Uh, so what is changing the strength of this circulation machine in the North Atlantic? And the answer is uh, related to winds, and particularly the westerly winds. So then we have to touch upon the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO. So bear with me here, it's a lot of new concepts. Um, the NAO is uh, defined as the pressure difference between the um, Azores in the south and Iceland in the north. So at some times this pressure gradient is strong, that's the positive phase of the NAO, and at other times it's weaker, that's the negative phase. So for a strong NAO we will also have stronger westerly winds, that's what I try to illustrate with these purple arrows. And uh, the stronger winds will actually influence the um, surface heat flux, or the ocean atmosphere heat flux, especially in the Labrador Sea. So um, uh, the, the positive NEO brings stronger winds, which induces stronger circulation. So in time, this will also lead to um, a positive A and B. So it's a whole series of events or interactions 
that are uh, influencing the AMV. Yeah, so I guess maybe you can understand that using the indices is uh, uh, sort of condensing everything down to an index and a spatial pattern, which is of course uh, due to many more complex uh, interactions between the atmosphere and the ocean. Okay, so I have one slide with the impacts of the AMV. Uh, it's a little bit of a busy figure. So if we first look at the background, we see the correlations between annual mean sea surface temperature and the AMV index. Uh, this is the time period, 1948 to 2015. So we have a positive correlation in the North Atlantic, this area right here. And particularly in the Southern Ocean, we have a negative correlation. Right, and then we also see that, um, so we have some areas with high pressure systems that are semi-permanent. Permanent. Uh, these pressure systems uh, are indicative of the positive AMO phase. Uh, we also have selected regions that are typically wetter than average and others are drier than average. So right here, the intertropical convergence zone is shifted northwards during the positive phase of the AMV. And this will influence what we call West African monsoon um, or the precipitation patterns over the African Sahel, just right here. So we can say that the AMV is a decadal scale type of mode, but it influences the general weather, uh, weather patterns. So this is influences that we will see on much shorter time scales. All right, and um, uh, Midwest US are also drier than normal during the positive AMV phase. Okay, then a few words about the reconstructions. I think this is very interesting. So I listed here a few of the existing uh, A and V reconstructions. And as you can see, uh, the two first are based, no, sorry, uh, number one and number three are based only on terrestrial data. And this is something I think is very interesting and we can talk about it more afterwards if you want. Uh, what is your idea? How would you say that the sea surface temperature uh, can this be represented by only land-based data? There are also uh, two examples with marine data. One is the Mann et al. 2009 global reconstruction. And Svensson et al, they use uh, marine proxies, but only uh, tropical coral records in this region. So this figure uh, is for my own project. It shows the region that I originally wanted to reconstruct. Uh, not, not particularly for the AMV, but, but making a sea surface temperature reconstruction. So these blue symbols shows the different types of proxy records that we have across the region. So the problem is, of course, as you might guess, that there's a huge uh, region without any data. So it's very difficult to make a, a meaningful, uh, skillful reconstruction in this region. So what I so far ended up with is that I sliced the region in half and I only uh, reconstruct the topmost uh, subpolar North Atlantic, so to speak. All right, so then onwards to the uh, PDV, specific decadal variability or oscillation. Um, I plotted here both a figure for the PDO. Or, uh, okay, uh, to, to clarify this, uh, like a traditional term has been PDO, so oscillation, while a more uh, modern word is using variability because oscillation is typically associated with 
more of a perfect periodicity, which the AMV and the PDV does not really uh, exhibit. So the PDO is mainly defined from the Northern Pacific Ocean, while the ENSO is defined like in the very equator, equator uh, region, but it will also influence the entire uh, Pacific region. I also plotted the indices to the right. And again, it's the time scales are very different. Uh, and so typically takes place on um, a seasonal time scales, while the PDO um, is more generally associated with decadal scale variability. So the definition is um, based on the empirical orthogonal function for the monthly sea surface temperature anomalies in the North Pacific Basin. And uh, the anomalies are, um, in uh, are obtained by removing the annual climatology and subtracting the global mean. So uh, two different studies find two different predicates. Well, they could also coexist one is for 15 to 25 years. The other one is for 50 to 70 years. Okay, so then onwards to the drivers. I think for PDV, it's even more complicated than for the AMV. So I can only say a few words like very generally. Um, the PDV is driven first uh, by atmospheric dynamics. You can only use uh, internal variability. Uh, this plot is uh, for the um, Aleutian low, which is a semi-permanent low pressure system off the coast of Alaska. And this uh, low pressure system will vary in intensity. Um, so sometimes it will be uh, lower and other times it will be higher. So this alone is a part of the driving mechanisms for the PDD. Then there's also quite uh, a number of um, indications that the El Nino Southern Oscillation is influencing um, the uh, PDB. So plotted here, map where exactly is the region where the uh, ENSO index is computed. So there are a few different regions and uh, plotted here for the Nino C.4, which is indicated by this black square in the middle. And the, like the PDV and the AMV, also the uh, ENSO cycle has positive and negative uh, phases. The negative phase is known as the um, La Nina. Right. Okay, so, so the ENSO cycle, or the ENSO variability influences the PDV both through the atmospheric variability known as the atmospheric bridge, but also through, for instance, uh, ocean Kelvin waves. But in general, uh, you need more processes to, um, to represent the PDV than you need for the AMV. All right. Then about some of the impacts, I only have here one figure for the temperature and the next one is for the uh, precipitation. So uh, this figure shows the, the temperature anomalies for the positive PDV phase. So you can see that uh, Canada and Alaska are the the western part of Canada is warmer than normal. And the southern part of the US and Mexico are colder than normal. And the same is true for uh, eastern Siberia. So it really influences um, a quite large region. Then looking at the precipitation, again, it's for the positive phase. 
the um, uh, Western US and Mexico will receive more precipitation than usual. Uh, while there's a, a small band near the um, coast, which is quite um, dry in this particular uh, figure. And also we can see that uh, Australia and the northern part of South America is also much drier than normal. The Indian monsoon is uh, stronger than normal. All right, so I guess you can also imagine that in the times when the PDV and the AMV, when their phases coincide, we will also have quite strong uh, impacts across the world. All right, so there are also a number of reconstructions for the PDV. Many of them are triggering reconstructions. And again, we have the MAN reconstruction, one reconstruction using historical documents and one for coral records. So this would also be very interesting to reconstruct. The problem is of course, uh, that data is quite sparse over the Northern Pacific Ocean. All right, so uh, the last part of my talk is about simple climate models and scaling. So now we've seen sort of uh, one class of simplifications, if we may call the modes a class, um, to explain sort of um, temporal and spatial patterns. So I want to take another step back to show you like the most simple climate model we can imagine. So uh, this is a linearized energy balance model. It is derived in Ryptal 2012, so I'm not going through uh, the derivation of this equation. It's an ordinary differential equation where we're um, following the uh, evolution of the surface temperature as a function of time. Yes, uh, just one second. Let's see if I forgot anything. Right, okay, so for this model, we need to know something about the forcing of the system. This is uh, F in our equation. <clears throat> and we need to know what is the heat capacity of our system. On, on Earth, this is dominated by the uh, ocean heat capacity. And then we need to put in a uh, climate sensitivity into our equation. So what we want to do with this um, equation is basically to solve it to find out how the temperature responds to a perturbation in the forcing. So if we solve such an ordinary differential equation, we uh, end up with a, what we call a convolution integral. So hold on. Uh, this is, think of this still as a simplified model. Uh, so don't panic. Um, this convolution integral is defined from minus infinity until t, but for all practical reasons, we will start it at time zero, where we have our observations. They have to start at some point. So we have some type of impulse response function, and then we have our forcing. And uh, solving an ordinary differential equation, uh, what falls out of this equation is basically an exponentially decaying function with a characteristic time scale tau illustrated here. So this is how the impulse response function looks like. And what's interesting is that uh, if we think of a system with such an exponential response to forcing, uh, then we can use the uh, autoregressive model of or order one as an example. So that's what's plotted here. It's an example time series, which you can see there's some variability. And I also plotted the power spectrum. So uh, the power spectrum 
we can think of like this, that we have an um, abrupt, um, quite steep slope here up to a certain time scale tau. So at the time scale tau, our system forgets about the forcing perturbation. Uh, so um, after this, it's uh, flat, so it's typically like a white noise. It doesn't remember anything about the past influences. Okay, so this is uh, what happens if we use a very simple energy balance model. And then now what I'm going to show you is um, uh, then what about the forcing? So uh, we will actually divide our forcing into two parts. So if we uh, think back of our figure for the global mean temperature, uh, we have some part which is deterministic. Uh, deterministic is a strange word, but for instance, here we can put in the trend due to or the, um, the, the forcing, which is uh, due to atrogenic emissions. While the stochastic uh, forcing is typically due to internal uh, climate variability and past processes. So we divide our forcing into these two components. And what's interesting is uh, that I will show you that um, the global temperature can actually be quite well described only using the stochastic term. So um, in some sense, you can think that uh, we have the natural climate variability, and then we have the trend on top, which is uh, the deterministic part. Okay, so then what is the deal with this scaling and memory? Uh, so here I have uh, plotted an example scaling process. So what's typical then is that the power spectral density follows a power law. So the spectral power is proportional to the uh, frequency as a power to the power of minus beta. And beta is then the memory uh, parameter. All right, so uh, this is an example long memory process. It has uh, quite some uh, long modes of variability, slow variability. And if you plot the power spectrum, it is uh, approximated by a linear fit. So this is for a completely synthetic uh, process. And then the idea is that our surface temperature looks very much like this. So I will show you that one more time. Uh, if we look at the global mean surface temperature and we subtract the linear trend, then our, um, our residual is extremely well um, approximated by a linear fit. I don't have uh, the value of beta here, but it's something like 0.9. So precisely what we found for the synthetic uh, stochastic process. So this is a very good uh, model, but the problem is, uh, what does it mean? So this means that um, the forcing or the response to past variability sort of never ends. So we have uh, memory on all time scales. This is called long range memory. And it's sort of counterintuitive for the climate that it has eternal memory. But my colleague uh, Hege Fredriksen and uh, et al, they presented in 2017 um, a box model representation, basically, where you can have a superposition of AR1 models with different characteristic timescales that you can approximate by one scaling model. Uh, so there are some uh, physical mechanisms that can be used to uh, support this idea. All right, so then I guess that's it. I only have my conclusions left. Uh, in the very broad sense, average weather is interpreted as climate variability on the cable time scales. And the system 
uh, is generally uh, composed of uh, many different subsystems that are interacting on a range of timescales. And um, this makes it necessary to uh, simplify our models uh, for better understanding. So both external forcing and internal variability contribute to these modes of variability that I have shown you. And they again uh, influence weather patterns across the globe. So we have some examples like the AMV, MDPDV, but there are also others that I would encourage you to read about. And lastly, we have seen a simple example of a, a scaling model that can explain uh, changes or the evolution of the global surface temperature. All right, thank you very much. So, uh, then the last slides are simply the references. I think I have to show them, but then I'm very happy to start the discussion and uh, to hear from you. Thank you all.